Okay, hello everyone. This is going to be our video on the surface integrals of scalar functions. So I have the definition already copied here. If f is a real valued function, which is continuous and defined on some parameterized surface s, then we define the integral over f, the integral of f over s to be, well, here's the notation. So the uh, the first two things on the left of this equation are just notation. You have double integral of f ds. And all the way on the right here, this is actually the formula we're going to use to compute surface integrals. Okay, so as I've already written here, you can see phi of uv is going to be our function that parameterizes the surface. Um, and all we have to do is multiply the norm of the normal vector by f of phi of uv. Okay, so this is going to look a little familiar. Uh, if, if you just delete f of phi of uv, this is exactly the double, in, or not, yeah, it's example, exactly the double integral that computes the surface area of a surface. Okay, so the only difference here is that now we're multiplying by some function, have an additional factor in order to compute a surface integral. Okay, so in general, we have a process, five-step process. You could probably make this into fewer steps or more steps if you wanted to, um, but these are the steps that we're going to use in order to compute surface integrals. So if you've already read the notes, you're familiar with this, but essentially first, right, we actually have to find uh, parameterization, right, phi of uv. So, in some problems, we might just be given a description of the surface S. Uh, we're not actually given this phi of uv that we have to plug into f. Uh, and of course, the tangent vectors t sub u and t sub v also depend on this parameterization. So uh, the first step is certainly coming up with some parameterization of the surface. This is why we practiced parameterization earlier in chapter seven. Okay, and then we're also going to need this. Uh, f of phi. Okay, so this is, of course, that first factor in the integral that I was talking about, right? This is that new factor that's introduced, uh, excuse me, when computing a surface integral that we did not have when just computing the surface area of a surface. Okay, so after we find a parameterization and plug it into f, we're going to have to find our, our tangent vectors. Now remember these tangent vectors t sub u and t sub v are just given by um, component-wise partial differentiation by u and v respectively. So t u is just going to be what you get when you take the derivative of each component of v with respect to u and t v taking the derivative with respect to v. Okay then we have to compute the norm of the cross product of those two vectors. Remember, um, tu and tv span the tangent plane. So uh, t, right, so when you take the cross product, this is now the normal vector of the surface. Taking the norm of that normal vector, well, that's like the area of the parallelogram determined by those two vectors. All right, so that's what gives us this little amount of area that we're actually going to be computing a double integral over. Okay, so um, of course we need that in order to, you know, just looking at the formula bare bones, yes, we need this norm, but uh, that explanation I just gave, that is kind of why this is there in the formula. Okay, now we need to find bounds for u and v. Yeah, so, you know, at the heart of it all, you know, this is an integral du dv over some region d. Okay, so we need to find uh, the bounds for u and v in that region. Well, d is exactly the region that phi maps onto s. Okay, so when we actually come up with our parameterization, we should already have an idea of what this d is. Usually it's going to be like some rectangle. Um, so uh, we'll get to that when we do a couple examples, but after that, right, that's everything you need. So you can set up the integral and compute it after. So that was just a run, quick rundown of the steps. So now let's actually get into doing a problem. So this is very similar. This first one's going to be 
very similar to one that I did in the notes. So evaluate the surface integral of 2y ds. Okay, so now this 2y here, this is going to be our f. So this is f of x, y, z. Uh, once we come up with a parameterization for the surface, then we're going to take whatever that y coordinate is of our parameterization, we're going to plug that in here um, into 2y. Okay, right, so it's important here, this 2y is not f of phi yet, this is just f. Okay, so now s is the portion of y squared plus c squared equals 4 between x equals 0 and x equals 3 minus z. So I kind of already gave away the punchline here, but right here, so this is s. Of course, this y squared plus c squared equals 4, this is a cylinder because the x is missing here. So this is a cylinder that is centered along the x-axis. And for each fixed x, it's equal to the circle y squared plus z squared equals 4. OK, and now we're given that, of course, we can't integrate over the entire circle, right? That The graph of uh, entire cylinder, sorry. The graph of the cylinder is infinitely long. OK, so we have to specify we want to be between x equals 0 and x equals 3 minus c. So if you're not able to use some sort of like Wolfram Alpha or Mathematic Mathematica to come up with a graph of this region, then um, you of course need to find out whether uh, 3 minus z is greater than or equal to 0. So the first step here might actually just be figuring that out. Well, y squared plus z squared equals 4. And this y, this is y squared, it's a square. So this is always positive. So in particular, that means that z squared, we're adding something positive to z squared and we're getting 4. So z squared itself must be less than or equal to 4. So z has to be between 2 and minus 2. And then from there, you get x, which is 3 minus z. Well, the largest z gets is 2. So 3 minus z is certainly greater than or equal to 1. OK, so there, um, this is how you can figure out that this plane, x equals 3 minus z, is the red surface here. So this red surface is x equals 3 minus c. OK, and it's important here to note uh, the red part is not. So there's a reason I made it red here. It's not actually part of s. OK, it's, uh, we're only integrating over the part of the cylinder, so the portion of the cylinder. Uh, we're not actually integrating over that plane, but we do need it, right, in order to come up with the bounds. Okay. So now, right, our let's try and break it down into the steps that I made earlier. So the first step is parameterizing this. So we want to parameterize uh, the cylinder y squared plus z squared equals 4. OK, so right, this is the graph of, this is what actually graphs the surface s. Of course, yes, x is between 0 and 3 minus z, but that's only really going to change the bounds of integration. It doesn't have anything to do with the actual surface s that we're integrating. So this is what we want to parameterize. So uh, why don't you go ahead and pause the video here and try to come up with a parameterization of s on your own. And then you can unpause, and I will do it here. OK, so now that you're unpaused, we want to come up with a parameterization of y squared plus z squared equals 4. OK, now we need a parameterization now 
it's pretty standard to use u and v here, but we need to come up with functions for x, y, and z. So the most natural thing to do here, since we have y squared plus z squared equals four, the most natural thing to do is uh, use cosine and sine, right? This is a circle. So we, you should think right away when you see y squared plus z squared is four, something like, well, the radius of the circle is two. So it's gonna be something like two cosine theta and two sine theta. So the, whether you assign cosine or sine to y or z is actually pretty arbitrary here. It doesn't really matter. Most people are used to giving sine theta to y because that's kind of the standard uh, switch to polar coordinates. Um, but uh, it's actually quite arbitrary. So now we still need to come up with something uh, for x. But, okay, in this cylinder, x is actually, you know, independent. It kind of runs in the background. And we are allowed two parameters here. So we're just going to keep x equal to x. It's just going to stay and kind of chill out. So, like, when we do the cylindrical coordinate transformation and z stays z, it's the same thing here. So x is staying x. And then y and z are going to depend on theta. So let's uh, just, since the definition was given as phi of u, v, let's just make this into a function of u and v instead of a function of x and theta. So our parameterization, phi of u, v, let's just say x is u. And now theta, let's replace with v. So we have u comma two cosine v, two sine v. Okay, so this is a parameterization of our surface S. Now, uh, what do we need? We need f of phi. Well, if you're following around, following along here, uh, hopefully you're writing these things down. Um, well, here, let me move to the top quick. F, we already established our F was the 2y, right? It's that function that we were told to integrate originally. So this is 2. Well, now our y is 2 cosine of v. So F of v is 4 cosine. So now all we need in order to actually set up our surface integral is the size of the normal vector. So of course the next step is going to be coming up with our tangent vectors. We need our tangent vectors in order to get our normal vector. Okay, so we're going to be using this phi of uv here, so let's keep it on the screen. So our tangent vector with respect to u, again, we're, this is just component-wise differentiation. So we're, first we differentiate u with respect to u and we get one. Two cosine v goes to zero when we differentiate with respect to u. Same with two sine v. Okay, and now uh, t sub v, again, component-wise differentiation. So we differentiate u with respect to v, that's zero. Two cosine v goes to minus two sine v and two sine v goes to two cosine v. Okay, so uh, why do we compute those? Well, of course, it's because we care about the cross product. So we need the norm or the size of tu cross tv. So why don't you go ahead and pause the video here again and try to compute the norm of tu cross tv and then unpause when you've finished doing that computation. Okay, so now that you've unpaused, hopefully you have an answer for this. Uh, so you should get two. 
uh, but let's just do it quickly. So first you're going to actually compute this cross product. So this should be something that you're very used to at this point. We've done a lot of cross products, but TU again was one zero zero and TV was zero minus two sine and plus two cosine of V, okay. So this cross product is zero, and we have zero minus two cosine V. And minus two sine V minus zero. Okay, now that we have the vector, we can easily compute the size. So the size of TU cross TV is the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So zero squared plus four cosine squared V plus four sine squared V. And of course we have cosine squared plus sine squared in here. So when we factor out the four, we get cosine squared plus sine squared is one. And this is just the square root of four, which is, as I said, equal to two. Okay, so now we need to come up with the bounds of integration. So uh, these are the values of u and v that we need in order to parametrize the whole surface that we're looking at. Okay, so if you look at the example we did in the notes, x was just given to go from zero to five. So it was pretty simple. Since x was just equal to u, u just went from zero to five. Well, now we have that x is between zero and three minus z. And we, always, we already established earlier that this uh, x equals three minus z, this was greater than or equal to zero in the region that, we're, that we care about. Okay, so we of course want x, which is uh, u, and so u equals x. We want it to range from zero to three minus z. Okay, but we don't have any z, okay? Now remember, when we're actually doing these integrals, z, x, y, or z, they can't hang around anymore. We have to, uh, we have to come up with an integral that is only in terms of u and v. Okay, uh, uh, yes, back here, right, so, this has to be an integral in terms of u and v. Okay, the actual parameters that we're using. Okay, so s goes from zero to three minus z. Okay, but z, uh, this was two sine theta. Okay, so u, ranges from zero to three minus two sine theta. Those are actually gonna be our bounds for the integral. And then afterwards, well, V, V is theta, okay? And we want, we used V um, or theta here to parameterize an entire circle. And we actually want we want the whole circle. If we wanted just a part of a circle, we would have to be a little more careful here, which I go more in depth uh, in the notes about. Uh, but for this problem, since we're, we want the entire circle here, um, this is exactly what we're used to. It ranges from zero to, poop, from all the way to two pi. Zero to two pi. 
Okay, now we have everything for our integral. So five, this is the last step. Uh, we set up the integral and actually compute it. So V is gonna go from zero to two pi. U goes from zero to three minus two sine theta. Oh, uh, uh, but V, V is, V is theta, sorry. So sine V, okay? And uh, the actual integrand we had, right? This was four cosine, four cosine theta, yeah. What we computed, ah, but again, keep thinking theta here, but we already said this is V, okay. And the norm, so this is our F of V for cosine V. And then the norm of, of the size of the normal vector was just two. Okay, du dv. Okay, so this is our integral. Why don't you uh, pause again one last time and actually try and compute this integral on your own. It's pretty straightforward. So pause here and try to do it. And we will do it when you unpause. Okay, now that you've unpaused the video, this is, well, the four and the two are just constants, so let's pull that out. Integral from zero to two pi, zero to three minus two sine V, and all we have left in here is cosine V. Okay, so that's good because the first thing we're gonna do is integrate with respect to U. Well, cosine V is constant with respect to U. So we get the integral from zero to two pi. And now antiderivative for this is just U cosine V. And now this is u equaling zero to u equals three minus two sine v. Okay, so we plug this in zero to two pi. And what we get, well, when u is zero, it just goes away. So all we have is three minus two sine v, almost forgot that two times cosine v dv. Ah, oh, yes, I meant to say this before I actually started doing the computation, but you should get zero at the end of this. So if when you paused and worked it out, you got zero, then you're probably good and you don't have to watch the rest. This is gonna be the last thing we do in this video. So. Uh, now you probably want to distribute this three cosine V minus two sine V cosine V. And this is all integrated DV. Okay. And now it's not absolutely necessary to do here, but I'm going to use a double angle formula for sine. So you can, of course, integrate sine V times cosine V just by doing the U substitution um, for either sine V or cosine V. It actually doesn't matter. Um, but I'm going to say two sine V cosine V I already have the two there, might as well. Well, this is just sine of two V using the double angle formula for sine. Okay, so now these integrals are very straightforward. Not that they weren't straightforward before. So here we get, well, uh, cosine V goes to sine V. So this is three sine V from zero to two pi minus eight. Uh, this is minus, right? Sine goes to minus cosine, so minus a half cosine of 2b. 
Okay, and now all you have to notice here, well, you can plug in 2 pi and 0 into both of these, but uh, 2 pi and 0 are the same angle, and we don't have any constants floating around here, really, so we're going to be doing sine of 2 pi minus sine of 0, uh, excuse me, and the same thing here, cosine of 4 pi minus cosine of 0. Again, those are the same angle, so uh, you should just get 0. And this is 0, and... Uh, this is zero. So in the end, we just get zero. Okay, in the next video, we're going to do another example of this, a little harder example. So I'll see you then.